I noted the preponderance of narrative and rules in the first five plus books of the Hebrew Bible. Well, how does that work out? How does the narrative go from here? The prophets tell the story. Actually, the Torah foreshadows the story. Deuteronomy foretells what will happen, but Exodus 32 actually gives us foreshadowing of how this works out. At Sinai, even as Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments, the covenant is being broken, literally broken by Moses and by Aaron and its other stewards. 3,000 fall that day. Israel is plagued, and that generation is dispossessed of the promised land. And that echoes what happened to the Egyptians. They were felled and plagued and dispossessed of what the slaves had earned. And God is going to have to make a fresh start for a future generation because this one just wasn't ready. We're used to thinking of the blessings and the curses of the covenant as meaning two roads that Israel is free to go down. And Moses urges them, I present to you this day two ways, death and life. Choose life, that it will go well with you in the land that God promised the patriarchs. The covenant and the blessings and curses at the end do present two stark alternatives. There's death, disobedience, vice, forgetting, forgetting Israel's heritage and its story, folly, and of course, idolatry, following false gods. Those are the wrong way. Moses wants to point Israel in the right way, the way of life, the way of obedience to the God who delivered it the way of virtue, of human excellence and flourishing, the way of remembering the way that they've gone and the promises that they're headed into, the way of wisdom, heeding the way things are and the way things ought to be, and worship, true worship of the true God instead of idolatry. Those are two stark paths. But God discloses to Moses in Deuteronomy 31 and 32 that the path of life will be a path not taken, at least not yet. That instead, Israel will fall away, fall into the curses of the covenant. And then, afterwards, God will deliver them. God will restore them. So it turns out that we're not looking at two alternative paths. We're looking at one way. A way of disaster and then deliverance. Typical philosophical treatments and theological treatments of how divine agency and human agency interact leave us at the personal level. God's will versus my will. Will I walk in faith or will I go my own way? By contrast, in the Bible, God engages societies, cultures, and whole peoples. Of course, the people of Israel in front, not just individuals. And Israel's history, as well as the covenants, blessings, and curses, as well as the prophets, as well as the New Testament, especially Romans 9 to 11, focus on Israel as a people not just a collection of individuals choosing which path they're going to take. Israel as a people is not uniform. There are always apostates and there are always faithful remnants, even in Israel's darkest times. But on the whole, as a whole people, Israel is going to inherit each consequence of sin and depravity. That ought to remind you of this chart depicting the ways that being off course will unravel us and end us in the wages of sin. And Israel is going to experience all three of these. Israel will be dispersed. Jeremiah 9.16 I will scatter them among the nations whom neither they nor their fathers have known, and I will send the sword after them until I have consumed them. That's the consequence of disposal, isn't it? In the conquest, Israel had dispossessed the nations of the land whose sins had piled up high enough, God says. Well, in Isaiah 43, Israel is harem. Israel is dispossessed. Verse 27, your first father sinned and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and I will deliver Jacob to utter destruction, to harem, and Israel to reviling. Striking language. Israel will become one of those devoted things to the Lord that's repossessed by a jealous God. Israel will experience the death that Moses had warned it about. Ezekiel 37, the hand of the Lord was upon me and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. Thus they were and to dust they returned. Israel is dead. Even if not literally dead as a people, certainly institutionally dead, its soul is dead. Its faith is dead. And then, at Israel's low point, God will begin a work of new creation to prepare them for their restoration and fulfillment. 
Israel will be gathered and replenished to be fruitful again. Jeremiah 23, after God announces discipline on the unfaithful shepherds that have misled and destroyed Israel, starting with verse 3, Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they will fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither will any be missing, declares the Lord. A return to the original fruitfulness, actually, that goes all the way back to Genesis 1. They will be fruitful and multiply. Israel will be reunited with the God it had spurned and be reappointed back to its status as the showcase people to represent him to the world. Isaiah 44, 21. Remember these things, Jacob and Israel, for you are my servant. I formed you. You're my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I've blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. And look at 23 here. Sing, O heavens, the Lord has done it. Shout, depths of the earth. Break forth into singing, mountains, forest, and every tree in it. For the Lord has redeemed Jacob, and listen to this, and he will be glorified in Israel. This work of new creation will bring exaltation to Israel, and therefore exaltation to the God of Israel. As you may know, here's how that scene in the Valley of Dry Bones plays out. God tells Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man. Say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they may live. And I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Down a few lines. Behold, I will open your graves and raise you from your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and you will know that I am Yahweh when I open your graves and raise you from your graves, my people, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and then you will know that I am Yahweh. Israel, having inherited the way of death and the consequence of the grave, will see beyond the grave to resurrection. The prophets announce Israel's replenishment its appointment, and its regeneration in coming days when God enacts a new creation. And those acts will reorient Israel, redirect it back to the goal that God had in mind all this time, fruitfulness, life, and exaltation. The trajectory of this covenant is not simply reward or punishment based on attitude or conduct, as for instance it is in Islam, but judgment for depravity, and then the good news of restoration through grace. And Israel's character is profoundly shaped by this sequence of its making, its calling, its deliverance, then its apostasy and ruin, and then its restoration. Something happens when Israel is dispersed and cursed and its institutions die. It learns to remember and to observe. We see this in Nehemiah 8 when the reading of the law is given. Israel learns finally how to be faithful, forging Judaism. That in itself doesn't and can't bring the full fulfillment of God's promises, but it does preserve Israel as perhaps the world's most resilient people. In the 1600s, King Louis XIV asked the philosopher Blaise Pascal to give him proof of the existence of miracles, and Pascal answered, why, the Jews, your majesty, the Jews. The Jews are a miracle after thousands of years of dispersion and persecution and assimilation. A remnant remains. It's uncanny. And the character that allowed all that to happen was forged back in the days of the prophets, back when Israel experienced the curses of the covenant. This key feature of Israel's story and character, and this key feature of the kingdom saga, is something that some visions of goodness can actually easily adjust to. A vision of goodness returning works well. A vision of goodness spreading, especially spreading from God's grace, works really well. Conventional ethics has a harder time adjusting to this because it tends to be focused on the temporal, on its own surroundings, instead of the broader historical context or even the cosmic context of its circumstances. 
And this explains why these otherwise helpful visions of goodness are in the end inadequate. Visions of justice rooted in a goodness merits mentality leave the wicked ruined because they don't merit. Goodness expresses style egoism and cultural relativism, which sees our actions as springing out of our intrinsic good, leave the wicked empowered because it doesn't take care of what's wrong with us. Goodness gets outlooks as well as goodness results outlooks often fail to discern that the true way to goodness is not a straight line from cause to effect. It's this line that runs from disaster to deliverance, which is deeply unwelcome as a message. This is why the prophets get rejected, because their news is not the good news people want to hear. It's the good news that we need to hear. Consequentialism has no way of foreseeing the good consequences of such catastrophically bad developments as curse, exile, dispersion, because deliverance is an act of God's sheer initiative and mercy. It's new creation. It's not a cause and effect phenomenon. It can't be predicted. God's prophets ask Israel these rhetorical questions. Who foresaw that this disaster would be a prelude to your deliverance and regathering? Was it your idols? Was it your false prophets? No, it was I, wasn't it? It was I through my true prophets. Our moral intuitions and our moral predictive powers are inadequate for consequentialism actually to work as an ethical system. No one, no eye has seen, no ear has heard the things that God has prepared. The story of Joseph going to Egypt foreshadows this. When he reunites with his brothers, he says, I know what you meant was for evil, but God meant it for good. What consequentialist vision can take into account twists and turns like that? It takes a prophet. It takes a man of dreams like Joseph to see what ordinary people cannot see. God's restoration of wayward Israel is going to take the form of new creation and unprecedented action. And this challenges even natural law ethics, because natural law refers to the former things, the things of old creation, and those pass away. Isaiah 43:18, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing. Isaiah 48, 3, the former things I declared of old, they went out from my mouth and I announced them. Then suddenly I did them and they came to pass. Because I know that you're obstinate and your neck is an iron sinew and your forehead brass. That's how stubborn these people are. I declared them to you from of old. Before they came to pass, I announced them to you. Lest you should say, my idol did them. My carved image and my metal image commanded them. You have heard, now see all this. And will you not declare it? From this time forth, I announce to you new things, hidden things that you have not known. They are created now, not long ago. Before today, you've never heard of them, lest you should say, behold, I knew them. You have never heard, you have never known. From of old, your ear has not been opened. See, grace doesn't just restore nature in a mild way, the way you might put something back that's fallen. Grace disrupts and remakes nature. This radical renewal even challenges divine command theory because the true power of God's word turns not to be regulative, not just ruling his creation, but creative, making something new. Romans 1, 16 to 1, 17. I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to all who believe. The true power of God's words is gospel, not law. It's the kingdom's remaking. That remaking renders cultural relativism problematic as an ethic because it confines an ethic to its old group setting, the setting that God is in the process of remaking. Even absolutist ethics fall short because they confine their understanding of goodness to a present which is out of context, out of the context of the kingdom which is remaking all things. I hope you're learning the lesson here that all conventional ethics struggle and they compete with each other as rivals and they fall short because they fail to respect the kingdom of God's obscure framework, the one that locates all of them. Only in that framework will things ever find their proper places. By contrast, Judaism as well as Christianity feature what's called an interim ethic, an ethic that waits and prepares for a future that's coming from without, from outside, that we can't bring about ourselves. Both traditions, Judaism and Christianity, although in different ways. Understand that this change has begun, but it has yet to be completed. Here are two pictures that frame Jewish expectation and the Jewish interim ethic. The first comes from the end of the Jewish Bible. The Hebrew order of the canon ends with 2 Chronicles chapter 36. 
Verses 17 through 21 describe the capture and destruction of Jerusalem. And then verses 23 and 23, which close the Hebrew canon, announce the proclamation of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the God of Israel wants Cyrus to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. And Cyrus' decree says, Whoever is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him. Let him go up. Let him go up. A very partial restoration of Israel begins when Cyrus lets a few back to rebuild a wall and a temple and get things going again. Israel is still waiting for the final fulfillment of the glimmer of that hope that began long ago, but it is waiting. The Jewish Bible has a different order in its Greek translation in the Septuagint. There, the last book is Malachi, and Malachi ends on a different note of partial fulfillment. Chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come into his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. He is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The Greek Old Testament, whose order matches the Christian Old Testament, trains Israel to wait faithfully for a messenger who will begin to set things in order for the coming of the one to fulfill everything. Those two texts are key for framing the Jewish interim ethic and the ways that biological Israel pursues goodness out of covenant faithfulness to its God. Christian expectation, of course, looks different because we understand the Messiah to have come, the first time anyway, and set into motion that chain of events. I'll explain more about the Christian vision later, but it still awaits for Jesus' return. It's too an interim ethic situated in between the first and the last comings of the Messiah. The elements of our ethics will be mindful of that context. Our goals, our virtues, what counts as virtue, our rules, which rules are appropriate for that moment, and even our reasoning and judgment, which of course are conditioned by our circumstances. All of those have to be mindful of the times. And there, Jewish and Christian ethics have something in common with a number of competing ethical visions. That's the idea that history has a direction. It has a beginning and an end. In fact, the notion that history has a beginning and an end owes a lot to the influence of Jewish and Christian visions, which lent to the world the idea that things aren't just going on forever the way they always have. They have a purpose, and so they have a direction, and so they have an end. Developmental ethics, such as evolutionary ethics, progressivism, the idea that history is headed towards some good end, and behaviorism, which thinks in terms of changing human behavior and therefore human circumstance, all of those developmental ethics think in terms of change over time, but because they don't appreciate or share that apocalyptic perspective between the times, their proposals are unsuited to the times, and they're even idolatrous. That's C.S. Lewis's complaint in his book, The Abolition of Man, that we have undertaken to make a change in human nature without understanding human nature to begin with. Certainly our era does not have in mind the kind of change that God promises through the prophets. Contemporary situation ethics, which teaches that what's good depends on the situation, well, that shares a key insight of Israel's and the church's interim ethic. That's the importance of context. Context can actually be determinative of whether something is good or not. Think of Joseph informing his brothers about what God was up to. But situation ethics falls short because it fails to discern our actual whole kingdom context. It tends to reduce consequences to the local, to the immediate or the short term, instead of thinking about the whole context of God's overall purpose for his kingdom.